Awesome. Oh, wow. I just wish my kids, when they had braces, had had that. That would have been super fun. Um, so we have our esteemed panelists here, Sai, Lee Kung, Ting Yu, and LD, as well as Gregory um, and Mikael. Uh, we're going to start with, oh, and Jonathan, too. We're going to start with the question on Opti structures for Sai. Uh, I read very compelling. Can you talk a little bit about ideas for simplifying the fabric? It looks like you may even have replied if I could figure out how to get to that. But why don't you reply for the entire audience? Yeah, um, sure. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, so, I mean, if you look at the process, it's, it's a little bit elaborate, right? But as with any sort of manufacturing technology, um, you know, automation is sort of key. Like if you look at, uh, you know, car manufacturing, when it first started, right? Like there was a lot of manual intensive labor going on. People were still trying to figure out, you know, how do you manufacture, what are the things that are needed for manufacturing a car or some uh, automotive industry? But I think as the process innovation actually happens, like for instance, you know, how do you uh, embed these fibers? How do you, uh, what materials can you work with? Uh, how does the casting process work? Once you know all these process innovation specific questions, then you can sort of start thinking about like, you know, how do you automate it? But having said that, I think one uh, idea, I think this, that could sort of simplify this process, this, project further is uh, combining it with like, you know, 3D cement printers or 3D, um, uh, you know, 3D paste extruders basically. And having that sort of like, you know, we already invented this uh, optical fiber extruder that can programmatically place optical fibers. Now if we can combine this technology with some type of 3D cement printers or any type of 3D paste extruding technology, then we can possibly simplify that further. At least that's, that's my few initial thoughts. Good thoughts. All right. Um, this is one for the whole panel. And then I'd like to see a few more or else you get AJ's questions and Gregory's questions and a few other people's questions. And that is probably less fun than your questions. So the question that came in and we'll just, uh, I'll, I'll call on you and we'll pass a little speaking stick, but it's interesting to see the span of fabrication themes here from very new ideas that might be hard to repro reproduce to democratization contributions that many can follow value in both and does anyone have comments on that i guess one of my thoughts would be how do you all think about where you want to be on that spectrum from pushing the boundaries to closer to uh commercialization um ld you're in my top left of my zoom window so you get to go first yeah i think um in terms of like thinking about manufacturing as our project is about hydrogen ligatures. I think it requires in, in the area of health, it will require a lot of uh, testing. And then it's also um, something that we mentioned in our paper is that something that we want to look into la um, later is uh, privacy related topics, because if we are collecting the data from people, then that's something that we should take into account. Um, and uh, yeah, but based on the fabrication, I think, um, yeah, when it's health related, I think that's, I think the most important part is data related uh, topic because it's like someone is going to use it and the device is going to collect the data from someone and that's going to go to a interface and that's going to be shared with, I don't know, with the uh, provider or maybe only with the person who is wearing the braces. Got it. Um, Ting Yu, Silver Tape, talk, talk to us about how you feel about the, the spectrum of, of your work or your work on that spectrum. Um, yeah, so we actually was inspired by the instant printed circuits uh, research. So it has been uh, widely used uh, for uh, very broad spectrum users. Uh, many researchers has uh, built uh, antennas or other functional circuits on top of the uh, inkjet printing uh, fabrication methods. Uh, it's mainly uh, uh, showing a very uh, strong, robust, and a bright uh, uh, future uh, in a very compact, uh, compact and uh, rapid manner. Basically, you can get your results very instantly and modify. Basically, when you have a design, you print, and you can instantly see the results. When, if the results is not working, you can just re redesign, reprint rapidly. 
we, where conventionally people has to design their uh, PCB circuits and send it out to the manufacturers and wait for a couple of days or up to maybe one, two, one or two weeks and get back their results or their PCB board manufacturer. So if they want to modify, they have to do the whole process again, which is really, really slow, uh, takes a lot of efforts. Uh, that's why people uh, see the brightness of this fabrication uh, method. But uh, as I mentioned in the, in the, in the paper, uh, in the presentation, uh, this kind of uh, inkjet printed uh, uh, method is uh, limited to the material selection, the substrate material selection. So we are just trying to leverage the material selection pool uh, at the same time uh, to serve a broader spectrum of users uh, by uh, like what I showed uh, many uh, um, unconventional application that has not been achieved by previous research. Yeah. Cool. I uh, love the rapid prototyping. Um, Likon Fle Flectile, talk, talk to us. Sai, that means you're next. <laughs> and then we can talk to the uh, other folks if they have stuff to add. Uh, yeah, most of, most of the related works uh, have several uh, compli uh, complex uh, fabrication methods to build some soft uh, uh, actuators. However, there still contains some rigid parts inside these actuators. So we are inspired, for, inspired from this. So we are going to build a fully elastomer and fully skin uh, applicable actuator uh, for some very uh, computing, so this one is also quite simple to to produce. Uh, to produce, it only um, all the things you need is a printer and some conductive silver paste. So you could finish it on your uh, own computer. So it it is quite convenient, mm -hmm. and uh, it uh, should be have a promising applications and we're going to do some further research about it. Mm, yep. Great. Sai? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, one inspiration for us or in general for me was um, looking at uh, comp uh, building materials uh, to be specific. A lot of my projects, uh, at least previous projects and current projects I'm pursuing right now is looking at this ability to computationally control building materials to be specific. I think um, you know there's there's new lots of new technologies that are coming out. You can 3D print with cement. You can 3D print with fiber reinforced composites. You can uh, 3D print with a lot of uh, new types of building materials. So that's sort of an inspiration for us um, for this project. And in general, I think um, you know there there can be a lot of uh, impact in the construction and R and D engineer uh, our, 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 um, construction manufacturing sort of uh, sector. But I'm a little bit worried also how much will the uptake be in these type of sectors? Because uh, off, so just two days back, I looked up some of the numbers on this type of stuff. And it looks like uh, the co construction and manufacturing industry is pretty segmented. And uh, they're like, they sort of rely on key suppliers on like, you know, different uh, supply chain and stuff. So I don't know how, whether we can actually make a sort of a positive impact in the world, but I do, um, I do think that, uh, you know, I, I think as these new technologies, you know, uh, you know, come out and we keep pushing the boundaries of what it can do. Uh, and if we can sort of convince like, you know, uh, players, key players in the field that there is potential value in, uh, you know, doing this type of work and stuff, I think there, there's more hope. I guess that's a bit of rant in the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you're working with infrastructure, you have different time considerations probably than an, you know, an inkjet printer, right? Right, um, yeah. I, I, did, I should have interleaved the other speakers from, or the other panelists from the pa uh, papers a little better. But Katya, do you have anything you wanted to add about Brace.io and um, where it is on the spectrum from hard to reproduce or, you know, pushing the boundaries there to democratization? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think uh, while well, complementing what LD was mentioning, as uh, we are uh, talking about uh, how devices, a health device that you will be even wearing side of your mouth, and we are talking also about biosensors. So there are other tests that maybe not they are not very common for our community. So we are we start doing ex vivo tests. And uh, and also we were also collecting saliva from the authors for making our tests. But moving forward, we shall be doing 
in vivo test, uh, moving to living cells, moving to maybe animals, and then doing the user test. So it's kind of like a totally different evolution for testing, and we will be like looking forward to those directions too. Uh, and yeah, I think that uh, as as we will be maybe uh, the future papers we see adding that biotechnology component to our devices, we we need to start thinking about that of biocompatibility, reversibility of our of our tests and how we can do uh, user tests. So you have a journey. Um, all right, I think the order I went in was next. Uh, silver tape. So, Gregory, anything to add? The answer can be no, too, and I have another question queued up, but... Um. Nothing to add. It was my question. <laughs> um, Mikael, anything you wanted to add about, about this one? Yeah, and probably, I, I see three things are important for this new material, or use of new materials. And the one thing is, is it, it, it needs to be to bring the community forward. It needs to be damn simple to 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 do yeah actually we we should give it to a student and he didn't come back and just can produce it and it works yeah it needs to be safe yeah for a large application area so no toxic material etc uh and uh, uh third it needs to be robust yeah otherwise we we are in a in a, a sort of a dead end street yeah uh we can make fancy things that work for a week and then basically they didn't work anymore. Yeah. And if we make that, yeah, uh, uh, then, then we, and, and we are in, on the road to that, then we will, uh, a new type of ubiquitous computing systems will appear. And it seems to be that this is just happening. Cool. And John? I would like to add something. Oh, sure. oh sorry. Uh, just to what Michael said, it just reminded me like during the process of fabrication or uh, fabricating the ligatures, it was like with the machines I had access to uh, in the lab, even though we were like during this situation, like the pandemic, um, I was trying to just think about like hydrogel has been used a lot for many other applications and there were different form factors with uh, hydrogel including like opti optical fibers or making filaments um, of hydrogel. So then, but at the moment of trying to make the hydrogel or, and use it to make the ligatures, the rounded ligatures, it was like, I had to find a way in which it could be easy to replicate. So at the beginning I had a lot of failures because I was trying to make um, films and then like cut uh, rounded ligatures and it didn't work. So at the end, the, the fabrication process that we showed on the paper is something that I think, okay, yeah, if someone has a 3D printer, they can do it this, they can just use that as a mold and then they can cure it. Like something that Michael said is really, I think that just reminded me like that was the solution for making the, the fabrication of the hydrogen ligatures in our project. So I think, yeah, replicate, replicatability, it's, um, yeah, it's important. Awesome. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so for a little bit of context, I'm actually a civil engineering PhD student and I have a background in structural engineering. So kind of building off of what Sai said, I think one of the really interesting things about opti structures is how we can integrate uh, this sensing ability into the structure itself. And from a, a fabrication standpoint, I think that's really appealing to the civil engineering and structural engineering community, how we can kind of make structures uh, work for things other than holding the building up. And I, I think that lends a lot of like ability to uh, this particular, you know, work that we have of saying, you know, can we take this wall that used to be just a plain old wall and now we integrate this optical sensing into it. So now it's an interactive wall and the ability to do that at a building scale. And then even at a city scale, I think uh, makes it really interesting and I think it will actually be pretty well received in that civil engineering community as well for that, because it's not necessarily interfering with the, the structure itself, but kind of enhancing it and adding on to it. Awesome. All right. I have one more question, but everyone has to give me like a 30 second answer if we're going to get through everyone before we transition over. 
Um, and this is, uh, I want you to think about it, which is what was the most challenging thing that happened? I think we may have just heard from, from Elvi part of hers. What was the most challenging thing that happened during this project that you really had to overcome? If you can give that to us in like 45 seconds, that would be great. We will start with Sai. I will go backwards this time. Okay, I guess this is an embarrassing example, but anyway. Um, That's so the, the best kind, <laughs> share okay. your knowledge. So the, I come from a computing background and Jonathan's from civil engineering background. And uh, the second example that we made for the paper was a cement table. Unfortunately, I didn't put any rebar in the, <laughs> in the structure and the entire like cement table broke in a span of two days. Oh. Uh, I guess that's another, I don't know. I, I always want to hear about the things you learn because we all learn from that. Jonathan, anything you want to add there? No, and that was uh, especially embarrassing for me being a structural engineer. So that was... <laughs> That was a, a fun and uh, challenging experience. It was a learning, experience. a learning, a very much yeah. a learning. And we were, right. we were scrambling a little bit to see how we could uh, salvage what data we had from that prototype. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your learning. Um, Ting Yu, do you want to go yeah. next? Yeah, so um, my challenge uh, that I can uh, recall was more about a technical challenge I had when I was uh, printing this uh, sewer tape. Uh, the, because of the brittle nature of a uh, sewer nanoparticle, which is the ink, uh, it's very easy to get uh, disconnected uh, when you when it's uh, when it's under uh, even very very little, maybe one percent of strain, or I'll say stretch. So I was by the very beginning of this project, I was thinking this sewer tape can be uh, used to to fabric a lot of like wearable devices. Uh, and you can apply, easily apply on your skin or on, on uh, your clothing. But by the end, that, that didn't turn out. Well, yeah. Great learning. I think we learned so much from the things that don't go the way that we wanted them to. Um, Le Kun, do you wanna share your learning, a learning? I, um, uh, in, uh, the, uh, the biggest challenge in our research is uh, the permanent magnet. Yeah, even though we have proved that a uh, small, smaller size magnet could be used to trigger this actuator, uh, such as a uh, one centimeter in diameter, but uh, we are trying to find some other solutions to replace uh, the uh, rigid and permanent magnet totally. So after that, we could uh, uh, we could have more permissive applications. It could uh, be uh, really, really soft. Uh, Mikhail, anything you want to add there? Or... Um, yeah, for... for hey, uh, hang on one second. Elding, hang on one second. Elding, hang on one second. I'm, I'm actually grouping the speakers this time. My, my, my attempt, that's all. <laughs> Did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I, so I, I want to add, uh, I mean, uh, the, I think the difficult part is, is on the forefront. Uh, it was the most difficult part was to find the right material and to, to get it supplied. Yeah, still, yeah, it's, it's, it's not like going to the next store and buy it. Yep, good, good learning. Thank you all for pushing the boundaries here. All right, Aldi, all you now. Yeah, what was your, what was your moment of learning? <laughs> I guess I wanted to say that the challenging uh, part was uh, finding the right the right um, saturations in in the biosensor and also for the body simulations like the testing the colorimetric reversibility it was something like varied because uh, saliva changes sometimes like the values in saliva changes from one day to another and it's based on your diet and so just trying like finding the spectrum to where we can have consistent results, same results, that was uh, challenging, like that took a lot of time. Um, yeah, but yeah. Good learning. Good part. Katya, mm -hmm. Katya, anything you want to add? No, I think that we already share a lot of learning experience. <laughs> <laughs> Happy with Excellent. that. <laughs> All right, I am calling out everyone who's on the call because there's like 75, 80 of you and they had to suffer through my questions. So I expect more. You can still add questions. The speakers will still answer them. So let's get it going. I know it's probably late. It happens to be early in my time zone, but it might be late in yours, but you can still rally. Okay, with that, um, what we're gonna do is all the panelists are gonna unmute and we're on three, two, one. We're gonna do a big clapping yay session and then we're gonna move on, okay? okay. Everybody who's a panelist, unmute, even those who have not spoken yet or whatever. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. I'm still seeing too many muted people, but okay. <laughs>
All right, ready? Three, two, one. Woo! All right. Yeah, yeah, jazz hands, jazz hands. Um, excellent. Um, with that, we will move on to the second half of our session on speech interaction. Let's get that those papers queued up. Great job, fabrication speakers.